All right, Dustin, you're just in time. <laughs> All right, sorry about that. Hi, Dustin. Uh, hi, I, I'm Dustin Katz, managing editor. Uh, and so we're going to get rolling, right? Yeah. We're All recording. right. Yep, yep. Just getting started. Okay. You want me to start? Yeah. All right. Yeah, go ahead, well, Dustin. I appreciate you taking some time. Uh, you know, kind of where we typically start with this is uh, just kind of walk us through your decision to to run for the seat um, and, you know, seek to represent Iowa in Congress. Well, you know, there's, there's multiple ways to answer that issue, uh, that big question, that looming thing that everybody, I think, has, who goes into politics has to, has to answer. Um, mine had a, a rather logical beginning. Firstly, I don't think you ought to run for office because you have a craven desire to be a sitting senator or uh, representative, county supervisor. I think there needs to be an element of duty, responsibility, civic responsibility. If you've got the background and the and the resume, uh, the sensibility, the, the the groundedness to do so, and if those, if your family structure around you uh, can support that, if you can support yourself uh, in the course of doing this, because obviously it's a it's it's not it's riven with failure in many and six out of one or one out of six uh responsible or situations so um uh in in my world uh as as the years go up and the 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 choices become fewer and those choices become more meaningful in the shadow of january 6 i have a lot of experience in washington dc and broad experience across the united states and the world um, I do believe these are serious times requiring uh, considerate uh, people and uh, amongst much much encouragement and uh, permission from those in my immediate immediate life. Uh, the, the responsibility was mine to say yes. And uh, so here we are. Uh, I do believe that in the end, I can do well for Iowa. Uh, and I, I would present a different type of candidate for the state of Iowa and rather unique uh, nationwide. Uh, and uh, I look forward to serving appropriately. Admiral Frank, and I'm curious um, with your, your last run um, against uh, in the uh, Democrat primary against Teresa Greenfield, what, what you learned from that and, and how that impacted your decision to run again? Well, it was... And that's that was a, a run where um, I was swimming against the, the desires of Washington, D.C. And what's unique about this run is the first time in decades that Washington has remained silent in the choosing of, uh, the, in, uh, of the candidates in the primary. And consequently, I'm the first candidate that Iowa, the citizens of Iowa, have chosen in a hands off manner. And I think that's unique. Uh, I have a much stronger uh, baseline uh, with those who have heretofore when when you have Washington DC the party the party uh, headquarters say this is our chosen one you are working against funding and staffing and uh, advertising and a whole bunch of other things so consequently last time although we we had a pretty good showing for the amount of money we we had um, we were outspent 30 to one in advertising you, know, you can't win doing that. Uh, so I learned that uh, you can't really work against City Hall very well. Uh, but if City Hall stays out of it, sometimes you can do pretty well. And uh, and and in that and and as we saw in the primary, that came to fruition. Uh, also, it matters to have a really good staff behind you. And there again, I was um, I was sub subtended by staff last time and this this opportunity we we had the ability to develop a more professional well-rounded broad staff and that uh, that helps a lot it also helps being a candidate once before being uh, more flatlined and not being emotional about the highs and lows that are that are afflict afflict, afflict a politician and uh, so I think I'm a I think I'm a more um, steady candidate this time around and um and all's going well thank you sure you know uh going into your primary uh and then since the primary um what are you hearing from 
the people in the state of Iowa, um, in, in particular, you know, Senate is a statewide race. So, uh, you know, you've got a very uh, diverse uh, a, a constituents um, from, with, and viewpoints. What are, you, what are you hearing as you campaign? What, you mean the issues? Yes. Well, if I, if I get 20 questions in an evening, uh, and we do a lot of uh, questions and answers. And, and matter of fact, uh, a couple of days ago, I think was the high bar. We did six speaking engagements, 90 minutes each, uh, and 683 miles that day. So give you an idea of, of, of what a day on the road is like in the Franken campaign. So, uh, you know, be packed, be, travel light, and move fast. So, uh, the, so if I had to list those, certainly women's reproductive rights is looms large in the in the shadow of the of the road decision education uh, firearms um, irresponsible gun ownership uh, a, a host of environmental considerations having to do with clean air clean water um, clean food supply voting and democracy is always uh, in the forefront especially in the shadow of January 6th uh, the energy grid in the state of Iowa, I've been alerting people at the, at the feasibility of how that can be expanded to change the business culture in the state of Iowa. Uh, and I think that's a that's an attention grabber. Uh, and the business opportunities that that presents. Uh, and you should be happy to know that when I speak of uh, getting the right word and, and separating ourselves and stop the dissension that we have in society that really afflicts all of us, and mostly in rural Iowa, uh, where the, the party politics loom so large that I tell people to get a subscription to the local newspaper and ensure the newspaper has a balanced view of things. And same to radio stations and the like, local talk radios. Ensure that they are balanced and you, the citizens, are the best judgment of that and the, uh, and the advertising that they do. So I, I urge that on the most molecular level, the local level that it's their responsibility to ensure that they're getting the straight skinny. Uh, and, uh, and, and we've developed a, a watchword, which I think is apropos for these, this session of, uh, of our lives. And that is a country before a party and people before politics. And, and I, 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 that was just a, a given in my life in the military. This is just the way we were and the way we thought. And we we stayed removed from the politics and uh, of the matter, and uh, certainly the specific party politics. Uh, but we need more of that in the political world because we are uh, broken and 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 di divisive in families, in social structures, and elsewhere. Thanks for that, and and you'll be happy to know that you are talking to a number of people who are working for the newspaper of the year for the state of Iowa for 2022. So. Oh, aren't 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 we uh, up and comers? How about that? Well yeah. done. <laughs> All right. Thanks for your response. Sure. You know, I'm sorry to say I don't think I have a subscription to your your your, uh, and I have so many in the state of Iowa, and and uh, I can't read them all, but. Uh, we could probably help you out with that. I'll address that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Back to you, Alice, Allie, and Dustin. Well, yeah, I've got. I mean, to to what you were talking about about this, the, the you know the the country before people, people before politics, you know the the kind of div divisiveness. Um, I mean, you know, right right now the Senate is split, you know, fifty fifty, um, and I I don't. You know, you can look at the polls and projections, but there's a, you know, a chance that we'll either kind of continue to have, you know, a very narrow margin Republican Democrats in the House or, or a potential for, uh, you know, Republicans to, to end up with the, I'm sorry, in the Senate, um, potential for Republicans to have a majority in the Senate. I'm, I'm interested in kind of how do you see yourself in terms of bipartisanship and um, being able to work effectively with, with folks whom you may not agree with, um, when we're in kind of an age and environment where we're at least down here, there doesn't seem to be as much of that happening. Sure. Well, so I, I have a history of doing nothing other than that. And in the military, you don't ask what the party affiliation is with anyone. And 
uh, even as a as now as a retiree, when I call my friends and ask them for my support of my candidacy, there are some that say, you know, love you like a brother, but no thanks. I support the other party, but we we support you as an individual, and we think you'll be great. And uh, and I got the moral support. They just don't want to be on a on the rolls as being a donor to a Democrat. That's fine. I don't. That's absolutely fine. But. All in all, everyone is very happy that I'm having this opportunity to do, to do so, regardless of the party, because they believe that I would be a, um, a a person to bring people together. And I think we undersell a basic human trait, gr grossly so, and that is leadership. Uh, we need more leaders in the Senate. We need people who are have a baseline of leading large organizations successfully not a hedge fund, et cetera, et cetera, or something like that, where you're in a bubble on the top, but people on the deck plates to be able to shake hands, be approachable, be affable, be knowledgeable, not be reaching back and asking for someone else's opinion of what they ought to say. People who think on their feet and give you the honest answer without a bunch of gobbledygook. Uh, let's face it, we've got far too much of that. We've got nonsense. People, people don't believe the, uh, the 2020 invest uh, uh, um, election was rigged. They don't believe that. They just say it though, because it's a pleasing thing to do, and it keeps them out of the uh, out of the scope of the Almighty on the Republican side, Donald Trump. And and it, this is this is that flaccid thought process, that lack of being a leader, which has gotten us where we are. And being wholly subscribed to a party dogma where you have to sign your name on the bottom line saying these are the precepts that you'll support as, as, your, uh, as a Republican. That's nonsensical. That's absolutely clannish. And that's what brings us to the nonsense we are today. Granted, the Democratic Party has plenty, plenty to, uh, uh, to do some introspection on. But the lineup, person to person, is not there, and never, I, and, and is, and is, and has never been there. And that's that's a rather attractive feature of the party to me. Uh, you can be an indiv individual, you can work to the needs of your constituents, and not be strident in supporting some demagogue living in a in a ten a hundred million dollar house. So, as a little bit of a follow up to that. Um... Um, I had read about some comments that you made um, regarding some people who uh, may have said some very derogatory things about our current president um, and, and um, using a, a um, I guess, a line that is flying on some flags that is, is oh, less yeah. than appealing. Um, and, and that you said that you did not serve in a military that supports those people. Um, I'm just I'm just curious as to um, how that relates to what you just said about nonpartisanship. Sure. Uh, well, that's an interesting that that's civility. That's a completely different horse. So here I am driving to uh, a little town in northern Iowa where I'm giving a veteran speech, and um, I'm ever happy to do that. I'm, did like six speeches that day. And I go through this other town. And I say, hey, listen, we've got how much time we have? 10 minutes. Let's stop in the VFW. There's cars out front. And let me just say hi. So I'm the senior military officer in the state of Iowa. I think I have more years in combat, certainly in command in combat, than all of the senators serving today. And, um, and I can relate. I spent 13 years joint. So Army, Air Force, Marines, it matters not with me. Matter of fact, an army officer promoted me not once, but twice in my career, once in combat theater. So I speak the multivariable language of the Department of Defense as much as anyone you'll ever meet. Uh, and so I go and I and as I'm driving by a block from an elementary school is a sign that says an unbelievable um, caustic thing, really vile and also racial regarding our vice president. So I said, okay, forget about this. I was, I was, I was like disgusted, disgusted with America, disgusted, not disgusted with America, disgusted with an element of America 
that has gone this far, and yet we don't have the civility in our small towns or the the ability to change that person's thought process to pull that flag down that's permanently erect. And it, it, it just bugged the hell out of me. Because on a military base, that person would have been drummed out, drummed off the base, uh, would have been a black mark on their career, and they would have been, in essence, terminated in the military. Because we just don't stand for that. That's just the sensibility. That's not us. That is the commander in chief. That is the vice president. And the vile language used on that guy's flag in a, in a wonderful small town America is absolutely disgusting and a sign of the times. Now, I talked to the mayor. I sent the mayor a note. And, uh, and the mayor and I had a, had a, had a wonderful meeting uh, just serendip serendipitous in Waterloo. And he came up, he said, I'm that mayor. And I said, hi, how are you doing? He says, that was the greatest note that you sent me because I shared it with my chamber of commerce, the school board, and everybody I saw in town. And we all agree with you, even my Republican friends, that there's an element in society that has a problem and we should not cause this to be the thing that draws, pushes us farther apart, but rather uh, brings us together and says, you know what, you're wrong. You're fundamentally wrong, and we'll, we'll, I'll support you as, you as your elected senator, but you're not the type of citizen that I was serving in the United States military for. You really aren't. I'm serving as an American that has, that has a high level of altruism, understanding, and ec an ecumenical perspective on their fellow humankind. And that person has let their emotions run astray, and it just upset me. And I you know what? Served a lot of years. That pissed me off. And, you know, it's an, interesting, it's an interesting thing. As you go back in history, was there ever a time like that when it was so vile? Was there ever a time? Yeah, Jefferson did some nasty things in his election, but it was never that. And we've got a large percentage of the population that are there, and there's one person who cheers them on. And then there's a whole group of Americans, and it's what Biden went high and right on the other night in Philadelphia. He said, I've had it, and I agree with him. I've had it. Knock it off. And that that person in that small town was a microcosm of that. Sorry, my perspective. You want a leader? You want a guy that says what he says, what he sa what says what he thinks, irrespective of the party politics of the day? That would be me. So I want to kind of link to that, but also link to some of the earlier comments. So um election integrity um there certainly are folks out there who do not believe the election was stolen and say so for political gain or whatever yeah. but in our neck of the woods there's a heck of a lot of people who are under this you know just fallacy that that votes were rigged and everything else if you're elected to congress how do you go about addressing that how do we get back to where people have that fundamental belief in this system? Well, I would ask those people to volunteer to be poll sitters. Get involved with this process. Here's, here's my guarantee. Find one that's worked an election. Find one who has actually worked the polls, stood that 16 hour day from morning to night and watched the process. And if you don't have that, that, insightful knowledge, then you're probably taking something off social media and parroting it. And let's, let's, let's put the perspective right. I mean, the president after the election, his attorney general resigned, he's firing people left and right. You've got a 28 year old who's his right hand person who was formerly a bodyguard. You got a pillow salesman, really? 
this is where we are in America. You know, one of the principles of George Washington when he gave his first inaugural address was the individual and around whom those he works. That was a principal problem with Donald Trump when he was elected in 2016. He surrounded himself with this cadre of questionable characters. And now where are they today? And the reason I was, I submitted my request to resign because I, I didn't want to be part of that. Quietly walked away. When they asked me to come back to head up a high technology task force in a pro bono basis is the only way I'd work, I did that. But I didn't want to work straight for that man because frankly, he does not represent my needs and I don't think America needs. And I'll stand by that to this day. And you'll see this in history. Uh, and so what we need to do as a nation is push through this, get through the voting ballot, let the uh, legal aspects of disposition run their course. Uh, those people who are going to wank about the next election, I suggest you get involved in it. At least vote, which the numbers of those people at the various rallying, the number who actually voted is a rather positive number, which is a fascinating uh, statistic, uh, kind of an expectation. Uh, get involved and do something about it. You mentioned uh, women's reproductive rights. That's uh, obviously fairly fresh. And, and um, you know, what do you uh, I think? I have a hunch on where you stand on that. But uh, you know, what uh, uh, role could you play if elected to the United States Senate? Well, we, this has been used as a as a cudgel for uh, one party against the other for the last what twenty five years. Newt Gingrich generated, et cetera. Um, and, and my opponent back in 1972 made it, said he was going to make this his uh, number one ambition while as an elected official, as I recall. So there you go. Uh, I, uh, I come from a, you know, I have a spouse. I have a daughter. I have six sisters. I'm very much engaged in civil liberties and human rights. And from a human rights perspective, I don't understand why it's principally men who uh, are involved in the decision to revoke a women's right for choice in their reproductive uh, years. I don't, I don't quite get that. Uh, and I mean, I view that as an, as an individual issue, uh, always has been and always will in the future. And, and why we would, uh, we would take that away from women specifically only women with no regard for men is something I will never understand. So, so what can I, Congress do? Oh, I would uh, set aside the filibuster reform and I would codify it and be done with it. That and a number of other measures. We've got to move forward uh, in society and we, we are hindered by party politics, which hold us back. What are the other measures? Are there any, I mean, I would do this with, uh, <laughs> I, I would, I would work very hard for a, a, a bipartisan um, immigration plan, uh, much reflective of the what 2013 or so bill, uh, make refinements to that and move forward. Every business I know in Iowa needs, needs staffing. Everyone I meet, everyone. Uh, every union says, listen, we've got far more work than we have workers. Uh, we can't pump people through the apprentice programs fast enough. Uh, we have, uh, we have ind undocumented individuals who are working for pennies on the dollar with no health care and no oversight, et cetera, that are uh, subverting uh, the job market and causing issues in society, causing issues in small towns, et cetera, et cetera, that, that they need to, they need to, we need to bring them out of the, the darkness into a pathway to citizenship. Uh, and those who don't deserve to be citizens, we need to send them elsewhere. 
we need a comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, we, we need to look at education. I don't think that's a filibuster issue. We just need, we just need leadership to bring some measures forward that address the things that, that, that are, that are causing such, such turmoil in our families and in society. Democracy, a voting, a voting rights bill is another great example. Can you, before you go on to voting rights, uh, can you expand yeah. a little bit more on the uh, uh, education and what um, things you'd like to see uh, uh, changed or that you'd, uh, components that you'd like to see? I would like to see pre-K to be part of the education package. I'd like to see um, apprentice training across the board and uh, community college be part of the education process. Uh, I do believe that higher education is something that sh there ought to be a cost to the individual in today's in today's America, but that cost ought, ought not be something that puts you in arrears for uh, generations, for a, for, a, for a decade to come. Uh, higher education is too expensive, uh, grossly so, and, and an increase in Pell Grants, et cetera, uh, is and and taking away the the interest factor in loans is is paramount to making uh, higher education more affordable. Great, thank you. Yep. Okay, switching switching gears here a little bit. Um, obviously, a lot of attention has been paid to um, the situation in Ukraine. Um, foreign relations as a whole, a lot going on all the time. Um, where do you see, I mean, what are your thoughts on kind of the congressional role there? How has Congress actions in recent years kind of supported the U.S. Uh, and its international relations? And where do we go from here? Well, the AUMF should be set aside as soon as possible. And Congress should take their rightful role in, in taking the responsibility of of our overseas engagements. And, you know, um, being uh, pain averting animals that many people are and wanting to stay out of the, uh, the limelight of the decision making of the most difficult of all questions, especially on matters that they know not and don't care to know because it doesn't involve their constituencies. It's, a, it's above their pay grade. They just don't want to, don't, don't want to care about international affairs. And there's, a lot, a lot of our elected leaders that are that way, uh, they would just as soon just slough that off to the president and say, yep, whatever, you know, I can criticize him, I can encourage him, only when the party politics and the polls tell me to do so. Uh, I'm, I'm quite the different candidate. Um, lived on four continents, lived on uh, two Muslim countries on two different continents. Uh, I, I've lived breathe international affairs, uh, diplomacy, humanitarian outreach, security aspects. The majority of the operations since 9-11 I've been involved in. Um, at one time I was the senior military officer on the continent of Africa uh, and uh, spent, I think, the longest tour of anybody as the plans and policy chief at uh, U.S. Central Command. Uh, during the uh, drawdown in Afghanistan, or draw, draw, uh, the drawdown in Iraq and the, and the push up in Afghanistan. A, a lot of experience in that area of the world as well. Um, I, I believe that uh, the United States is a beacon of stability worldwide. I also believe that we have made uh, crucial mistakes, usually not based on knowledge, based on uh, quasi um, ignorance of the matters and uh, more on emotion than on insight. Uh, I would be a, a stabilizing voice of that from the U.S. Senate, and I think I would be helpful in ensuring that the White House and the Department of Defense, State Department, etc., are, are coalesced as an entity going forward, and the priorities are adjusted as to who has lead and uh, and when we should not get engaged and when perhaps unfortunately we should. Uh, regarding Ukraine, anybody thinks that that, oper that 
that uh, unfortunate uh, assault on Ukraine is going to be uh, short-lived is, is fundamentally wrong. Uh, that's going to be multi-year uh, dystopian wasteland in some areas in Ukraine. And uh, the only way Vladimir Putin will be uh, find some, uh, will, will be turned back is to have the, the assaulting forces push back across the border. It's as simple as that. Uh, because he he has he has no constraints back in uh, Moscow on his actions, so consequently it's it's him versus uh, the will of the world. And and what would you advocate? Uh, what role or actions would you advocate that the United States do, uh, have in that? Well, going forward, I would uh, I would uh, impress upon like-minded nations where we need to do in the future forcible evacuation operations, we should do that. Uh, meaning we will, we make the announcements, we give the necessary no TAMs and nay TAMs to say, we're going to do this. We bring in an overwhelming force and we do evacuations such as in Marpol that should have been done. That, that, uh, that, that lays, that lays an ace on the table and says, okay, Putin, you're lay. We didn't do that. Uh, this is there's going to be uh, many other opportunities to do that, and we should be quick in in ensuring that we are again the beacon of humanitarian outreach uh, and to to try and help the civilian population. Historically, in conflict, for every soldier that dies, six civilians die, and for every year or every month. In conflict, you lose a year of infrastructure, and this is not going to go well, folks. This is, we're going to need a Marshall Plan at the end of this. Uh, and worldwide, we have yet to to feel the impacts of the lack of uh, uh, the Ukrainian uh, plantings to come to market. This is going to get far more ugly than it than it than it gets settled. Uh, so, regarding what we're doing. I agree with uh, President Biden. He's constantly upping the ante on the capabilities that we're providing the Ukrainians. Um, and, um, and this will make them the bulwark to ultimately roll back the invasion, the invasion forces. This is not going to be a pleasant situation, folks. I, um, I was first involved in that area of the world in the cooperative threat reduction talks and development and the conventional arms reductions uh, in the 1990s when I was uh, working as a Senate staffer uh, in the nonproliferation uh, offices and others uh, with many of the people that are involved in doing it today. So I've got some deep history in the area. So as we, I mean, we've been writing a lot about economic conditions. That's one of the things that the, our readers are, are constantly talking about, inflation and, and worker shortages and, and all these different factors. There are things, you know, measures, steps that have been taken, the effects of which are, are just starting to play out. Um, what else should or could Congress do to kind of address the current economic conditions? Well, we've got to be careful. Uh, you know, so the Federal Reserve runs interest rates. And they're, they're an independent body. Uh, they got to be careful with how fast we raise interest in America. We got to also be a little careful in how much money we flood the market. Uh, we've got perhaps still ill effects of too much M1. Granted, we've got too many goods and services chasing too many products, uh, too few products. Um, We have to encourage people to come back to the workforce who have decided to step aside. Uh, I do believe there's an opportunity for a voluntary national service program uh, to assist young people in deciding what lines of work they would like to do in the future. Uh, that would, it doesn't give you immediate support, but it provides long-term improvements to what people choose to do in life and perhaps less college education that they can't pay for because they no longer want to serve in that area and they got to go back to school or something to that effect. Uh, and you know, 
with a voluntary national service program, there's a lot of people who are uh, in their 50s or 60s. They decided to drop out of the job market because they don't, they don't need to anymore. They've got enough savings. But this is opportunities for them to get involved in volunteering at a small salary to assist that next generation in various fields from forestry to agriculture to the VA to uh, education, a host of issues that, that we can use assistance in in the job market. And I believe that as, as Pete Buttigieg used to talk about in, in 2020, um, that program enhanced would be a, would be a signature development uh, that the Biden administration could do. Uh, I think we're going to see effects of the of the Inflation Reduction Act that uh, provide a fabulous new segment of what I call gray collar uh, gray collar jobs, higher pay, uh, more high tech, and more environmentally sound. Here in Iowa, we have the ability to have the most inexpensive energy grid in the nation. Uh, we we have some individuals that and some organizations that stand in the way of that, but we are truly in the catbird seat. Uh, there's a couple of technical things that we need we need to get working on as a nation and to develop a program for, I think, um, small scale, no fail nuclear reactors for the power generation because we need something to bridge us into a into a fusion uh, future, and it's not there yet. Uh, and uh, Iowa has a place, as I mentioned earlier, to be a net negative, a carbon. And um, I'm a big fan as a technical person, as an engineer and a physics person, to uh, to make that a very, very high import in the legislation that I push forward. You, you mentioned a little bit about uh, uh, returning to the workforce. Are there some categories? Uh, of uh, of people of workers that you think are are not the workforce uh, that you'd like to see return and how you could help uh, facilitate that. Well, I mean, this is I haven't looked at the numbers recently, but uh, as of a year or two ago, we had the fewest number. This is before the pandemic, matter of fact. We had the fewest numbers of working age adults in the workforce as a nation. I believe than we've ever had, uh, certainly in in a generation or two. So, and, for, and, and many people have have valid reasons uh, not to. But they don't have to. So uh, they've decided to do something else. They're involved in purely uh, volunteer work. Uh, they have spouses, etc. I mean, all those reasons we we all know. Um, so I, there's not a category I'd like to see come back. I would just like to afford the opportunity. Because I think the interest is there with many people. I talk to people throughout the state every doggone day, and I and I pe I meet people who are younger than me. And they say, "Yeah, I, I stepped aside when I was, you know, fifty something or sixty something, uh, but I'm still engaged with a few things." Well, their their expertise is still exceedingly germane. Their leadership, uh, their ability to to uh, to assist in a workforce. The opportunities need to be presented, and and I believe there are a lot of uh, civilian or a uh, private operations that that are such, but I think the government can can develop a, a volunteer national service program that would enhance that. And here's the other thing: the youth of today, the youth of every generation, uh, is rather happen chance in how they mix. And those that have a broad experience in multiple zip codes usually have a better job of mixing uh, and having a more broad perspective and a different friends network. That's not necessarily a bad thing at all. I view the fact that I grew up in 51250 zip code to be a great honor. It's thanks, thanks to my folks to have that stability. But I also am very thankful to have had 20-some, 30-some zip codes since then. You mentioned um, a little bit ago, you talked about firearms. Uh, obviously, there's a couple of sides to that as you go around the state and your position personally, you know, uh, how, if, if, if at all, uh, should, uh, uh, 
firearms need to be addressed in light of you know the Second Amendment, but also the um, uh, challenges that we are seeing you know with with mass shootings and so on. Um, so, well, I have a unique background in firearms. I grew up on a farm. Grew up in a very rural situation. One of my first paychecks came as a result of shooting broke gophers uh, for the county extension agent. Um, was to carry around a, a 22 before it was when I was before I was too strong to carry it. Uh, having been in the military for associated with the military for 39 years, um, being a land forces commander in a land, in a combat area, uh, there's none. There are none of those weapons that you see on the street that I haven't qualified on. Uh, and oddly enough, the, uh, the, the firearm used in Buffalo, New York the other day is exactly the firearm fitted as it was, kitted as it was, that I'd be happy with walking through Ramadi in 2006 with it. Why we have a demonstrably irresponsible individual in society in possession of that firearm is prima facie why something needs to get done. Um, I'm not talking about yanking your weapons away from you. I'm not talking about kicking in doors. I'm talking about responsible firearm ownership. And here's the thing. If, if, if nothing moves a patriot America any more than this, just think. Uh, we hold this, this terribly unique position in, in, in worldwide where the number one cause of death of school-aged children are firearms. Having been responsible in my career for Somalia, Yemen, Central African Republic, Mali, uh, elsewhere, why is it that America has that distinction? Libya? I mean, it's crazy. It's absolutely absurd. It's irresponsible. My job is to, is to impart responsible gun ownership. And those legions of army soldiers, police, um, they agree with me. And one of the reasons we're seeing um, increased number of interactions, violent interactions with police, is because the police are rightfully so scared. They're facing firearms that that and and, ir, and, a, and a host of irresponsible firearm owners in this nation who caused them fear. And fear is a great quality to keep one alive. And, and, and as, a, as a person who's been there, um, we must, as a society, do something about it. Here's, here's, a, here's, a, here's a pet little story. I'm in Karlskrona, Sweden sitting around a table i went up there uh, at the behest of the swedes to discuss how a country mobilizes to go into conflict and around the table is a is an assortment of individuals and we're going around asking names and one younger fella says in very good english uh and i said where'd you learn your english and he said oh i went to high school in in, in uh the united states i said oh where i ah, never heard it Try me. Place in Iowa. Oh, really? Where? Hayward. Oh. Well, who'd you stay with in Hayward? Oh, the Bodners. He's looking at me like this. The Bodners. And I said, oh, the photographer. He was my photographer when I was a kid. Okay. Jaw-dropping moment, right? So I said, are your kids going to go to high school in America? No, it's a not quite safe enough for them to do that. Okay? So we go on. Another person, a Finn, he's from Finland, very good English. Where'd you go to, where'd you learn your English? I went to Iowa, a high, Iowa high school too, not for one year, but to two. Where? Uh, UL Ames, Iowa. Oh, my sister lives there. Who'd you serve with? Uh, it was a milking family right out of town, right out, right out of town. I didn't know who they were, but I knew where that farm was. He, too, 
Well, we have only have a daughter. My wife does not want, want her to go overseas, plus America, not America. If we send her overseas to school, we'll send her to England. Okay, so if that, I mean, if it doesn't move you at all, as an internationalist, such as myself, I'm appalled by that. So what does change look like uh, in your mind? Well, here's a perspective. The United States military sells firearms, weapons-grade firearms, to the civilian population every year. Do you know that? Congressionally mandated. But not just any uh, pickup driver shows up can buy one. You must go through a qualification process. That's a five-step process with two background investigations, including on the range, uh, very akin to the civilian marksmanship program. It used to be something that the NRA kind of touted, and they've long since become something entirely else. Um, and best of my knowledge, to the best of my knowledge, never have one of those firearms been used in a mass shooting. Why? Because we only become part of the sales cadre if you're a responsible, a known responsible individual with a medical record that justifies that. So it sounds like you're talking about some sort of expanded background check. Oh, God. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think, you know what? Um, so what, what we're having in America today, and it's, there's not being printed enough, are now gun factories of ghost guns. So not, not much different from a meth lab in your garage, not in your garage, but in a garage, where you've got a couple of yahoos building firearms, selling them en masse. So there's just more than just the re personal responsibility. There are gun laws that have to happen in, this, in the United States. Here's the other thing. Look at the percentage of crime that's committed in Canada with American firearms and Mexico with American firearms. We've become somewhat of the, uh, the element, the criminal element that sells firearms to criminal elements. Now, is that our reputation? I mean, you've got to be clear-eyed about this. And you know, if the gun industry in America today, if uh, you know, the, the, the number of people that now sell an M5, or, uh, an M5, we call it, uh, an, A, an A4 equivalent firearm, has expanded. Why? Because there's big money in it and a big demand for it. But in Iowa, there was no way to use that firearm to go hunting, with the exception, I think, for Bobcat or something like that up until the legislature, for no other reason other than to be fan favorites of the industry, made it legal to shoot deer with it. And for women, Ollie, this is an issue that affects women more so than anybody else in society. Because the number one casualty to firearms in America is the gun owner. Number two, it's the love interest of that gun owner, usually a woman. Number three, a close family member or family member or a close friend. And obviously the husband, the gun owner in 80 some percent of the time, and that other person suffer consequences, but the woman is left holding the bag. And if we, and if we, and if we talked about it like that, Men imparting their misdeeds on women and their freedoms on women, maybe we would have a better society. Great. Thank All you right. for expanding on that. Yeah, I appreciate that. We want to, I know we got a late start here with the technical difficulties, but we want to be respectful of your time. Uh, I have one kind of final question, I guess. Um, so Chuck Grassley, I mean, he's 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 been around for quite a while. Out of most islands, I would say have a pretty good feeling of of, of Chuck Grassley, whether or not it's it's accurate. Um, 
if you're making a pitch to the average voter, what's one or two things that differentiate you from Chuck that, you know, is the reason they should vote for you instead? Uh, well, I have a passport. Um, I am, uh, I don't take, uh, I don't take corporate PAC money. Although the Republicans say they did a little ad the other day that I, that I have, just so you have background on that. Some politicians in other states have provided funds to me. Usually those politicians that I've worked with in the past or worked, uh, they work for me in my, in my job in the military and they take corporate PAC money. So a proportion of what the thousand bucks that they sent to my campaign came from their corporate PAC money. So if you distillate that, it's something like it's a minuscule decimal percentage of my money that comes from, comes by one, by one extension. So this suddenly stains me, uh, whereas Chuck Grassley, 300 and some thousand dollars last quarter, even though I outraised him by a factor of two, comes from PAC money, plus his dark money. We don't do any of that. My, my, my staffing comes from Iowans. My money comes from individuals. And uh, we're the first can we're the first campaign that has um, outraised him, and we don't and, and and I'm a citizen's choice. Secondly, you know Chuck Grassley's past is he thinks an 18 year old can have an assault weapon, but he also thinks an 18 year old shouldn't doesn't have the maturity to vote. Look at his record. It's true. He's the one that's taking your freedoms away, and this is men and women. Because many, many, many couples I know go through in vitro processes. He says, you know what? What's next? Contraception? Yes, it is. It's Ooh. next. Um, Chuck Grassley has given us the agriculture industry that we have in Iowa today. Now, this has been very helpful to big ag. They have the profits in this last multiple years have never been higher, have never been higher. Yet, half of farm income in what, 19 came from subsidies? One half? Is that the structure of an industry that we want? This is Chuck, Chuck Grassley's legacy. Speaking of legacies, let's talk fairness, basic fairness. He has an opportunity to bring to the floor for vote a nomination to the Supreme Court. 18, or correction, 11 months, 11 months before the election. And he stalls using heretofore unheard of precedent. And yet, when he has an opportunity to do the same in a 26 day period before an election, even after 80 some. Correction, 65 million votes have already been cast for the president. He says, oh, that's fine. Sneak her in there under the wire. Now, regardless of any of you know, he's, he, he's not an athlete. I played a lot of sports. I would like to see fairness in life. And I think the government has a responsibility to be the referee in life. Who among us think that's fair? It's not fair to be able to impart your sensibilities only because you're in a sitting of power and then immediately reverse that the next opportunity you can. Make sure we all know that Merrick Garland had already been approved by a very high percentage to two sigma by the United States Senate for a previous lower posting. This is who we have. He's a party hack. Put a name on it. Uh, and part of the problem and he's been around for 63 years. And tell me what his signature achievement was other than giving us the most partisan Supreme Court we have ever had going back to the 1930s. And you can cast that in stone. And if you look at his voting record, there's a knee in the curve after 2000 where it started getting 
very well trot chained into party politics. He quit being the bipartisan level voice. Things happen in life. I don't know what's happened to him or has happened to his staff, but it affects his performance to Iowans. And the fact that he voted against a $35 cap on insulin tells me that this is all about big pharma, $1.4 million to big pharma versus the 240,000 Iowans who have, who have uh, diabetes. There are no other rationale for that other than being a, being a, party, being a party hack and not doing what's right for his constituency and not what's not right for the nation. I can go on. I, I have books on his, on his voting record, ad nauseum. But the fact that voted in with, the, with, the, with a strong sense of KKK and John Birch to where we are today, started one way, ended the same. All right. Well, yeah, I think you covered it. Uh, appreciate appreciate the, the discussion and you making some time for us. Uh, sorry, I think on both ends we had some technical issues, but I think it worked reasonably well. So thank you for taking some time. My pleasure. Thank you all. Um, you, you should know about Decora. Um, my mother, although we lived in northwest Iowa in a very rural situation, um, she always hearkened about her time at Luther. And, uh, and what a beautiful area uh, that area of, of the United States is. And um, her little, it was her little Switzerland where she came from. So. Sounds great. Well, Thank have you. a good one. Thank you all. Bye-bye.